Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. My name is George Westay, Robert Principal here. It's a real delight to welcome you to Pusey House. I'm not going to say very much. I'm going to hand over to Dr. John Ritzema. John is uh, works with uh, Dr. Jonathan Price to organize uh, and help to put on the academic life of the house. Some of it under the umbrella of the Center for Theology, Law, and Culture. Uh, it's a real delight to welcome the Reverend Dr. Callie Hammond to be with us today. Dr. Hammond and I were ordained, and then we were in the same post ordination training cohort. It seems just like yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> in the Diocese of Ely, you moved less far away, we're in another wonderful city. Yes. Uh, the, the, uh, and uh, Dr. Uh, John will introduce, uh, introduce uh, uh, Callie to you all. Um, Please, uh, if you're very welcome to take one of these term cards or lecture cards on your way out, uh, describing other lectures that we're having this term, and I think John will send around um, a, a sign-up sheet if you'd like to receive notices about these, this, lectures like this during the term. Please do sign up. It's a delight to see you all here today. I'm fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to have a, a nice full room for the first lecture of term. Um, before introducing. Uh, fairly properly, um, let me just say a few very brief words about what we've got on for the rest of Michaelmas, and indeed you can pick up a term card from the desk at the front uh, at the end of the lecture. We have a full series of these uh, Recollections lectures this term. The Recollections series, if you haven't been before, is our regular series on great ideas and figures in Christian history. Um, uh, on Wednesday the 8th of November we've got the Reverend Christopher Smith, to uh, give a talk on the great 20th century Anglo-Catholic theologian E. L. Maskell. He'll be speaking on Maskell's Doctrine of the Incarnation. Uh, on the 15th of November, we return <coughs> to St. Augustine. Mike uh, Mashiachlin will be speaking on uh, Augustine's asceticism. On the 21st of November, that is uh, seventh week in, in term time, we have the, uh, a lecture on the idea of an a priori law by Dr. Ralph Walker. And I think, Jonathan, that's with the Humane Philosophy series, which is a, 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 a Blackfriars-based um, uh, series of lectures in conjunction with the theology faculty. Uh, last but not least in the Recollection series, we have the Reverend Professor Simon Oliver, who's the Van Milder Professor of Divinity at Durham, who will be speaking on the creation. Um, in addition to that regular programming, we have on the 13th of November a special lecture on faith in public life, by Morris Lord Glasman. Lord Glasman, some of you may have come across, uh, he is a, a, a Labour life peer, he's an academic lecturer in political theory, and he's the founder of the, um, the so-called Blue Labour movement. Uh, in terms of his own religious faith, he's, um, he's a practicing Jew who's very involved in his local synagogue in East London, but academically his doctorate was on uh, Catholic social teaching. So it'll be a strange and interesting fusion of Catholic social teaching, Judaism, and the Labour Party. So do, do come for that if you would like some uh, esoteric Pusiot politics. Um, last but not least, on the 8th and 9th of November, we're doing a two-day conference on the aforementioned E.L. Maskell. E.L. Maskell was um, 20th century Anglicans, uh, Anglicanism's major uh, Thomistic theologian. Um, there were more of them than you might think these days, uh, there, there were quite a few of them, he was a very influential thinker um, who was based in Oxford and then at King's College in London. 
Um, we've got a full program of speakers for that. Rowan Williams is giving a keynote lecture. Um, Philip Moller, who is the new lecturer in uh, modern theology at Campion Hall, is going to come and give a, a sort of Roman Catholic perspective on various things. Our own Clinton Collister, uh, Dr. Robin Ward, it's the full team for that. Um, as you've heard, uh, that is a fairly full programme of events for the term. If you would like to be kept up to date and to hear more about it, we have a sign-up sheet here for you where you can uh, give us your uh, email details and we could be in touch with more things as they come through term. My glamorous assistant, Dr. Price, is going to pass that around the room. Um, he also has uh, a donations basket and a card reader. Uh, Jonathan's line is that... <laughs> jo Jonathan's usual line at this point is to say that Pusey House is a very rich institution, but not in financial terms. <laughs> We've been blessed with many graces by it's, God, but it's, not necessarily money. It's more true than you realise. Um, indeed. So if, if you feel um, moved by the spirit of generosity to contribute to uh, our regular academic programming, We'd be extremely grateful for any donations um, received. <laughs> so, without further ado, let me um, properly introduce our speaker this afternoon, the Reverend Dr. Um, Callie Hammond. Uh, Callie took her initial undergraduate and doctoral degrees uh, in Oxford, in fact, across the road, I think, at, at St. John's, so um, within sight of Pusey House um, in Classics, before heading <coughs> eastwards to Cambridge to read uh, theology in preparation for ordination. Um, as you'll have surmised, she combines those two areas of academic expertise in, in classics and theology with her work on St. Augustine, uh, the great Latin father of the North African church. She's well known as the translator of the Lerb series, uh, the Lerb Classical Library um, uh, version of Augustine's Confessions, but has written a, a really wide variety of different academic and popular books, um, everything from a translation of Caesar's Gallic War to a book on the sound of the liturgy, how words work in worship. Uh, and I gather there's a new forthcoming <coughs> volume in the Lerb series, which is going to be uh, Augustine's De Doctrina, right? That's right. Marvellous, fantastic. Um, uh, Augustine's great work on Christian teaching. But today, Kali is going to be uh, addressing us for the next 45 minutes or so um, and talking to us about Augustine the poet. Kali, over to you. I'm purring after that marvellous introduction. <laughs> it makes me feel so clever. And now I have to fess up and tell you all the bad news. Um, there's not a lot of poetry in this lecture. <laughs> I'm so sorry if you feel you've been sold apart. But I'm going to explain why, and it's not quite a, uh, such a, a con as it may appear. Uh, I hope everybody's got at least a sight of, an, um, of a handout. Is that right? Excellent. There are some more at the back if anybody's short of one. I want to go and grab one quickly before we go on. Um, we have to share if you're doing we have yeah. one just, okay. um, just a quick word while they're sharing around about what's actually on this uh, sheet. It's not um, got any bibliography on it because the bibliography on Augustine is so enormous that I, I think we have to chop down a forest to print it. That's my excuse for not having read any secondary material. Um, but um, I'm hoping that what I'm giving you here is some of the top bits, in my opinion, of Augustine's Confessions, that my favourite moments um, when he comes closest to writing what I think most of us would regard as very modern prayers. Um, and I'm giving them to you in my trusty edition. Um, other versions are available considerably more cheaply, I might add, but they don't have the Latin in. Um, and I'm also giving you quite a few chunks of Aristotle. And that does need a word of explanation. It will all make sense as we progress. And I'm hoping to persuade you, not that Augustine wrote lots of poetry we don't know about, but that what we do know about what Augustine wrote is actually poetry. So let's look at the actual poetry we've got. Three traces I've given you on your sheet. Um, page one, the first column. There is a fragment um, of poetry from book 15 of The City of God, where he refers completely in passing to the lines that he wrote about a wax candle. Um, so we know that he wrote poetry. We knew that anyway from the Confessions, because he tells us so. There's the second example, not actually a piece of poetry, but a reference to him entering a competition to recite a poem in the theatre. It sounds a bit like All My Welsh Ancestors and the Eisteddfod, where everybody had to go and um, produce poetry. 
Um, and he's obviously referring to this in terms of um, his disgust for fortune telling, but we know he wrote a poem for it. The bad news is that there is one extended poem extant, and it is truly awful. Um, it's, called, it's known mostly as the Psalm Against the Donatists, which gives you a clue um, to, from the beginning that this is a piece of polemic, so it's not written from the point of view of the wonderful Augustine that we meet in the Confessions, the individual in search of God. It's a man fighting a battle for orthodoxy, and it sounds like it. And it's quite interesting from a formal point of view, A, because it's not metrical like classical poetry, and B, because it's not regular. Uh, but it is what we call accentual. It follows the natural stress of the word. So it sounds a bit like this. I've just given you one line of it. Omnes qui gaudetis de parque, modum ve rum judicate. That gives you the rumpty tumpty flavour of what's actually quite a long poem. What he's doing in it, just so you know, is um, it's a sort of version of Ambrose. Ambrose is the first Latin father to make a habit of teaching doctrine through hymns and to use accentual, natural word stress that people naturally spoke Latin in to make it easy to remember stuff. Um, and this is Augustine's version of it. You can find it on the internet. Everything about Augustine is on the internet um, if you want to read it. And I'd be very surprised if you don't concur with my negative judgment of the context. Right. That's just to prove that he could write classical poetry. Uh, we only have him writing Latin. We don't know if he ever wrote Greek poetry. He didn't enjoy Greek. And if he spoke and wrote Phoenician uh, at home, uh, Punic, we don't know anything about that either. It's Latin only. We do know that Augustine wrote a lot, and he wrote in lots of different genres. And in the ancient world, everybody writes um, in generic categories. It's, it's the same with us. We don't think, I'm just going to go and express myself. We think, am I going to write a newspaper article, or a letter, or a piece of other journalism, or an academic argument? They're all genres. And so he, he wrote a genre too. Things like speeches, we call them sermons, but speeches are, are a classical genre. Or epistles, people publish their letters. Dialogues, that's in the style of Plato and Cicero and so on. But there's a big problem with confessions about what kind of genre it is. Um, because there isn't anything, anything like it in the classical world. Nothing. The closest I think we come to anything that gives us an insight into an individual human person, the uniqueness, the psychological self-examination, will be some of the most intimate letters of Cicero. But he isn't there exploring what it is to be a person, whereas Augustine is doing that at some length and in a great deal of depth. So Augustine wrote a lot, but confessions is not easy to categorise. What I'm going to try and persuade you is that it's poetry. But to do that, of course, the first thing I need to do is redefine poetry. And this is where <laughs> Aristotle comes in. Uh, because if you look at the bottom of your first page, the first column, you'll see that I've given you a famous quotation from a famous theorist on rhetoric, Gorgias. And he says that poetry is speech possessing metre. In other words, if it's rhythmical and rhymes, he's not thinking of rhyme, but it could be, um, it's poetry. So everything that stops before the end of the line and starts another line and then another line, that's poetry. Anything that goes on from like this here, from one end of the line to the end of the next, that's called delineated, <coughs> that's prose. That's the best definition of prose I've seen anyone yet come up with. Prose goes on to the end of the line. There isn't a more complicated one, really. Um, but Aristotle's Poetics, written the best part of a millennium before Augustine was around writing confessions really does help us to understand what Augustine's text is all about. Because the first thing you need to know about Aristotle's poetics is that he has no truck whatever with Gorgias. He says poetry is not words in metre. It's not words rhyming or anything like that. It's not even Hebrew parallelism. Poetry is judged by one criterion only, and you can see it at the top of your handout. Um, have you got, is there a spare one knocking about? Can somebody share this? Um, a, you're completely run out, okay. Um, well, you'll just have to imagine. <laughs> Download it off the internet later, I hope. Um, uh, Aristotle starts with a problem at the top of that column, Poetry Explored. We have no agreed word, he says, for 
uh, what people write, which is an imitation. He says, some people say that medical writers and scientific writers are poets if they write in verse. And he's thinking of people like Empedocles, and if he was um, post, uh, if he was writing in Latin, he might have thought of somebody like Lucretius writing De Rerum Natura on the nature of things. It's science. Is it still poetry if it's in meter? Well, Aristotle says no. He says, Homer and Empedocles have nothing in common except for meter. What makes a poet is something else. It's imitation. So he doesn't look at content. Uh, he doesn't say um, it's whether the gods are appropriately depicted that tells you whether it's poetry or not. He doesn't look at meter and rhyme. He doesn't look at what's called a pair cola et cometa layout, where you have an artistic shape to the lines. You stop them where you think the breath would be and go on to the next line and that kind of thing. Aristotle thinks the key thing is imitation. Mimesis is his word for imitation. So he's answering the question in, um, I think, quite modern terms. He's answering the question about what poetry is by asking, what does poetry do? And the key answer he comes up with, and I agree with, is that it imitates human life. Poetry imitates human life. Uh, it's commonplace in Augustinian studies to talk about Augustine's debt to Plato, or more likely Neoplatonism by someone called Plotinus. And that's perfectly legitimate. Um, but we do have to be careful where um, mimesis is concerned because Plato didn't like anything that smacked of imitation. It said imitation means derivative, it means secondary. Whereas for Aristotle, writing a little later, imitation is creative and imaginative and gets us to the truth. That's the key thing in a moment. To make more sense of this, we need to understand where our word poetry comes from. It comes from a Greek word, poiesis, which means making. Poio is the Greek word for I make. Um, and it very quickly takes on the specialist meaning of making a piece of written text. So by the time Aristotle's writing, he can use the word poiesis, and he knows that people mean, will understand that as artistic written text, not shopping lists and phone directories. Uh, trying to persuade people of a point of view, uh, something that's got artistry to it. So poetry comes from that. And at this point I need to make one other um, caveat, and that's to people who perhaps aren't so familiar with the ancient world and its literary genres, and that is to say, we're the children, whether we like it or not, of the Romantic movement, and when we've heard of Wordsworth or not, we tend to think of poetry as a quotes, spontaneous overflow of powerful feeling. It is not that in the ancient world. It certainly isn't spontaneous, and I don't think I've ever met anybody who spontaneously expressed themselves in iambic pentameters. So, um, <laughs> there might be somebody there, you can tell me, but I've never heard of them. Writing is for persuasion. That's the point. Writing's expensive. It costs a lot of money to learn how to do it, and it costs a lot of money to do it, because paper's expensive, and so is ink. So you don't just write rubbish on your piece of paper. It's for communication and persuasion, and it's orientated to your audience. You want to produce an effect. So what I've given you on the first part of the handout is 11 short sections from the poetics. It's a very long, very complicated text, which I've been trying to make sense of for 30 years plus, and I'm still not really there, but anyway, I'm struggling on, and now you have to too. I've mentioned the first one on the sheet, uh, where he introduces poetry as imitation. Um, if you look at the second, number two, he reinforces that. He says, most poetry is mimetic. And he goes on to explain that in a bit more detail at number three. Number three, I think, is an important passage, because it's where he starts to explore poetry in terms of universals and particulars. Um, Aristotle is very interested in this. Um, for example, Aristotle was not remotely interested in history because he said history was about particulars. You know, what happened to me yesterday might be history, but it's not important. And everything that happened to me yesterday, from the moment I put my socks on to the moment I clean my teeth, is not interesting. It has to be selective. Uh, and so we don't want particulars, we want universals. Poetry talks about the kinds of things that happen. It talks about shapes and ideas and patterns. <coughs> 
It's about universals. And in that respect, he's in complete uh, agreement with Augustine. Augustine's not interested in history either. There's bits of history in City of God, but he really doesn't care. It's not about truth with a capital T for him, because it's about specifics, and he's interested in more in principles. In this respect, I'm wi wildly generalising here. He makes the point in section three that poetry is more philosophical and more worthwhile because it speaks of universals. And I think to some extent we can agree with that because our own understanding of poetry is that it draws us out of our particular sphere and locates us or plugs us into something <coughs> bigger than ourselves. A bit like God in that respect. We'll come back to God, of course. <laughs> um, so if we go with Aristotle for now, Augustine is a poet insofar as he writes words which imitate reality. You can see where I'm going with this. We don't want to think platonically. Imitation is not secondary or derivative. Uh, imitation is poetry. And anybody, can I just check, who's read the Confessions here? It doesn't matter how long ago. I'm not going to put you on the, okay, loads of you have, brilliant. Um, I don't know if you remember, but it's pure, my niece is pure imitation. It's a conversation, one side of a conversation with God. And you do get little fragments of God, God appears, you'll find him in one of the passages in a minute, um, God does appear and say stuff, and quite a lot of the time Augustine is having a conversation with God through the quotations from scripture. Scripture is sometimes God talking to him, and sometimes he's quoting it, and it's him talking back to God. But there is a conversation going on, it's a dialogue, and that's the key thing. It's an imitation of a conversation. It's poetry, I think. So, here's a sad... Um, reflection, which I really wish wasn't true, but I think it probably is. If you think about Augustine's output as a writer historically, what he starts with is the poetry. He starts with dialogues that he writes uh, between himself and other people. The most interesting is the one that I've just um, translated for the Lobes, along with De Doctrina Christiana. I've translated De Magistro, the teacher, which is a conversation with his son shortly before Ardeodatus' death. So he writes lots of dialogues. He gives those up later because they're a little bit too classical. Um, and he writes confessions. And after that, all the stuff that we love him for, all the prayer, all the poetry, all the spiritual insight and stuff, it more or less disappears into a load of theological output about why God must be this or ought to be that or could possibly be the other. And I would suggest that in these early days of his um, writing career as a Christian, he was less driven by the need to enforce orthodoxy, and he was less clear about what orthodoxy consisted in, because he did change his mind about stuff. And I think he was also less gloomy about the capacity of human beings to reach God, and to resist, or not resist, their own good. I suspect that's the church we have to thank for uh, spoiling the Augustine that I think we meet in Confessions. Um, and what I don't know and would love to, and this is why my answer to the back page of the Church Times column is, I want to be locked in a church with St Augustine because I want to know if he carried on praying and having visions. Because we don't really know um, whether the picture we have of him in Confessions is the end of that episode of his life. Anyway. Um, Section four, we're just um, at the bottom now of the first page and turning over, I've given you a little paragraph of uh, Aristotle where he talks about the causes of poetry. And one is not so interesting, that's about harmony and rhythm being natural to human beings. The exciting bit is that human beings are natural imitators. A man with no psychological training, uh, no biology, <coughs> not to speak of anyone, um, in our sense, modern science, he, by observation, realises that human beings learn by imitating, that we enjoy imitating. It's natural to us. That's mimesis. So poetry is natural, is one of the arguments I think we have to make. When we go on to, uh, this is a whistle-stop tour, you can understand, I'm hoping you'll go and look at this later. Um, when you go on to 5, 6 and 7, which I've grouped together, um, we're looking at universals versus particulars, as applied to a human life. Okay. Why is Augustine's life something that means or matters anything to any of us? 
Why isn't he just one of the faceless millions of Christians who've lived their Christian lives and died their Christian deaths? Uh, because it's mimetic, because it's poetic, it's universal. It can speak to all of us. And just very briefly, I'm particularly interested in, Augustine, in um, Aristotle's view of tragedy. And I would suggest that there are quite strong connections between confessions and tragedy. I'm talking about tragedy in its proper generic classical Greek sense. I'm not talking about the way that it's loosely used to mean anything sad that happened recently on the news. Um, and here, um, we don't have time for much more than an outline, but I would argue that Confessions is written as a drama. Uh, we can talk about the um, beginning of Confessions versus the end uh, in the questions, perhaps, but just for now, we're going with the shape of the human life. So, Aristotle says that tragedy needs to be an imitation which is weighty, complete, and having amplitude. It, what she means is serious, weighty, again. It's got to be beautiful speech, it's got to be dramatic, not narrative. So you can't say, um, once upon a time Augustine was in this garden and this happened and that happened. That's narrative, we don't want that. It's got to be Augustine's actual conversations, his actual words. And through pity and fear, it produces the purging of emotion. That's what tragedy is, according to Aristotle. Well, I would say Confessions is weighty. Yes, it imitates a human action. Yes, I think it's complete. We have the movement of a human being from birth to Christian rebirth. That's just one way of putting it into the shape. It's got attractive speech. It's quite simple Latin, Confessions. It's conversational. It's much harder work translating some of his other writings. Uh, but this is relaxed. He's talking to God as you talk to a friend. And I think that shows. It ought to show in the translation. It shows in the Latin, for sure. And it's certainly dramatic. We're only getting half of the dialogue, but it is a dialogue, because Augustine is answering God when he listens to him. The trickiest bit is Aristotle's famous comment about the emotions of pity and fear being purged. The word is catharsis. Um, and it, it's very complicated to explain, and uh, I'm not sure I've got the hang of it, but there it is, that's what he says tragedy is about. And I think if we're talking about pity and fear producing catharsis, we can see that in Confessions quite straightforwardly. He calls the reader to repentance, he undergoes a change from one state to the other through his pity and fear uh, of death in particular, but other things as well. If we move on to plot and character, which is six and seven, still on Aristotle, for it to count as a piece of tragic poetry, there has to be an element of moral decision making. Again, I think that's a box we can easily tick with confessions. It is. You see anatomized before you every element of the process of struggle, um, it's, a, it's a bit like when you, people talk about the stages of grief. You see him go through all these different stages. Do I really have to? And what if I do it later? And <laughs> well, wait a minute, but what if that happens after I do this? You see it all laid out in front of you in all its elements. And there has to be amplitude. That's why um, Aristotle is not so interested in comedy. It's not that it isn't an imitation of life, because it is. But it doesn't have stature. And it's got to be important and matter to people. Um, which is why, you know, in the pecking order of Greek literature, tragedy is always above comedy. Mm. Um, I'm not sure that that's fair, but that's just the way people are about miserable being grander than being happy. I don't know why. Um, Aristotle's word for plot is mythos, from which we get mythological. Um, and that can mean any kind of conversation. It's quite close to logos in some of its usages. But it can also mean a story. So Aristotle thinks that a tragedy imitates an action, um, and because of this, um, you, you, you see it being um, enacted through the character of the participants. So there's something fundamental, fundamentally important about the people who are doing the action. They have to be behaving in the right kind of way. Um, I'm going to skip over number eight because I know we're not going to have time for it if I get onto the prayers, which is what really I suspect uh, I care most about and probably all of you too. 
but I do want to look a bit more at plot and character and the three elements of movement of tragedy, because these are also very important. This is 9, 10, and 11 on page 2. Um, plot and character are the two most important elements of Aristotelian drama. He thinks that plot is more important than character. Uh, I agree with him. In modern literature as well, I think that um, I can put up with poorly drawn characters if the plot pulls me along. Anybody who's read an airport pot boiler, you know, doorstop kind of novel, which they know is utter trash, but they still want to find out who done it. Um, like that Tony Hancock library book. Do you remember the last pages dropped off? I think I've got that right, haven't I? <laughs> Was it Hancock? Somebody nod at me. I'm probably showing my age, never mind. Um, but anyway, we want to know what happens. We want the thing to reach a satisfying conclusion. We don't want to have broken off in the middle, wondering if he's going to become a Christian or not. That's not a proper plot. It needs a beginning, middle and an end. And we want characters who are appropriate. And into that mix, we have to throw three characteristics of tragedy. One is peripatia, meaning an overthrow. People have to move from one state of affairs to another. They can't just be there. Okay? Something has to happen. I, once, I think the most boring play I ever went to with my husband, we were so excited, it was Judy Dench and Maggie Smith doing a David Hare play, the name of which I thankfully forgot, it's never been performed since. And it was just these two women in a room moaning. Um, and even those two brilliant actresses couldn't make it exciting because nothing happened. <laughs> and they were interesting characters, but on its own character is not enough. You need plot. Something has to change from A to B. So that's Peripatia. You need recognition, anagnoresis in Greek. You need people to see something that they didn't see before. And you've only got to watch a, a soap opera or you know, read your pop boiler novel again. Do you know that the moment when the scales fall from somebody's eyes in the drama, it's so-and-so. Um, very exciting. That's what people come for. That's what motivates them. And we certainly get that in the confessions. We get Augustine recognising who he is and who God is. <coughs> so this boring Jesus, whose story was written in terrible Latin, which it is, to be fair, um, <laughs> who he was far, far too well educated to, uh, waste his time on, suddenly becomes my Lord and my God, my Saviour, <coughs> the living word. It's an incredibly exciting moment. And then there's pathos, suffering. And I think it's hard to read confessions and not see the suffering that he went through for himself. There's also his mother's suffering for him, although frankly <coughs> I think she deserved some of it. Um, and uh, don't get me started on Monica. I owe her a lot. She's answered some prayers for me, but uh, I still think she must have been dreadful. <laughs> so, um, and his friend that he doesn't tell us the name of who died. There is real suffering and bereavement in confessions. <coughs> so we want all these elements to be part of our particular, you know, it's not just any old poetry, drama. Uh, and here it is in Confessions. We've got overthrow, we've got <coughs> recognition, and we've certainly got suffering, at least right the way up to the extreme in Book 8, where he cannot bear it anymore, and goes to the garden and has his vision. Character, I'll just say briefly, um, character needs to be good, but not perfect. The character needs to be uh, plausible. It's got, they've got to act in a way which is natural and appropriate to their position and circumstances. They've got to be realistic. Not real, necessarily, but realistic. And they've got to be consistent. And Aristotle rather charmingly says, if the character represented an inconsistent person, he ought to be consistently inconsistent. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, is perfectly fair. So, um, that brings us to the results of our whistle-stop tour through Aristotle's Poetics. Actually, I should have asked if anybody here has read Aristotle's Poetics as well. Has anyone? Oh, there's a few girly swats in the audience. <laughs> we should have said that these days. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me that. Um, so. <laughs> Hate speech. <laughs> I'd like to apologise on behalf of my gender set. I'm also <laughs> Let's move on to the results of this poetic analysis. <laughs> I can't push uh, the Aristotle point too far. Ancient readers would not have read the Confessions and thought, oh, what a lovely piece of poetry. They really wouldn't. They were just like us, and they thought poetry ought to have rhyme and rhythm and artistic design to it. Um, 
they, in other words, they went on thinking of poetry as, as uh, determined by form rather than content or uh, object. Having said all that, I still think that Confessions defies categorisation. It does not belong to a genre, not one that I've ever read anyway. I've never read anything like it before or after, and I think probably all um, psychological biographies are, are basically takes on confessions of one sort or another. But it seems to me the one thing that is really obvious about this is that Augustine meant it to be this. He did not mean us to solve the problem of why it's 13 books when Virgil wrote 12 books and Homer wrote 24 books and another 24 books, where 12 is the good number in Christianity and it's a good number in the classical world as well, and 13 is either meaningless or a bad number. Why write 13 books? And is it 8 plus 5, you know, up to the point of, conf of his um, conversion and then the rest, or is it um, 1 to 10 and then 11 to 13, because in 11 to 13 um, he's doing something different, he's giving us an exegesis of Genesis. I have to tell you, after reading the whole thing, line by line and translating it, it makes absolutely perfect sense to me that he would move from the microcosm of an individual human life to the macrocosm of the universe that God has created and put human beings in. I think it's absolute genius, and that's the only way I can make sense of it. But it does not conform to any kind of genre that I've ever heard of. It's weird. Um, I think it's... Um, I think it's mimetic in nature, deliberately. I think Aristotle, uh, Augustine sets out to write something which is, yes, about himself, but not because he thinks he's special. He does resist that quite strenuously in Confessions, and he knows that it's a temptation that he has to resist. It's bad for him. Um, he, wants, he craves um, applause and admiration, like most of us do. And he admits as much in the text, I think, as a way of insulating himself against people um, lionising him and treating him as a saint. I'm sorry about that, Augustine, but I'm going to go on calling you Saint Augustine because you deserve it, even if you don't like the fact. Um, he wanted, by writing and publishing confessions, to change people's lives. And it's not an accident that people have been reading this book ever since it was first written, which they have. I would call it realistic because it's universal. It's not real, because Augustine inside the text is not the same person as the Augustine whose pen wrote on the papyrus, I don't think. I think Augustine in the text is a character presented in, uh, in the conversation with God. I don't mean that it's not real, um, but I'm trying to say that you can't assume that he's told us everything that we think we need to know. He's only told us what he thinks we need to know about the process of conversion. And one tiny clue to that is that he never gives you the name of anybody who wasn't a Christian. Um, so if, most obviously we never find out the name of his concubine, and we never find out the name of his friend who died in the early books of Confessions, because they weren't Christians. He's only telling us the things he thinks we need to know. I'd love to know what the concubine's name was, but I never will, and nor will anybody else. Confessions is realistic, it's not real. So, we're going to turn now, possibly with a great sigh of relief, but keep it quiet or you'll hurt my feelings. Um, we're going to turn to Augustine himself, but the first bit I want you to look at, because I've realised that it's in the wrong place on the handout, is right at the end, the last bit of page five. Um, I've given you a section from book two of Confessions um, on why he writes the book. And this is actually a really rare glimpse. Well, there are a few glimpses like this, but there aren't many, and this is the only one I can think of from the beginning. Why did he write the book? Um, he's finished book one. It's incredibly artistically careful. You know, he's carefully put the word Magnus at the beginning, and I've carefully done the same thing in my translation, because I think it's that important. The first word of um, City of God, does anyone happen to know? Gloria Sissima. Um, it's, a, it's a cool word, actually. It's got lots of lovely syllables. But, but Magnus and Gloria Sissima. Um, he doesn't put words down by accident anywhere. The very last word of Confessions, does anyone happen to know that? Very powerful and important word. Aperiator. 
it will be opened, he says. And every time I think of that, I get goose pimples. I'm getting goose pimples now. Him saying, it will be opened. Get on with it, you know, be me. Go through what I've been through. You too can have this in your life. At Perieto, it will be opened. <coughs> but here he is in book two, telling us about his audience. And he gives us two clues in Confessions, two big fat ones. <coughs> one is at the end where he says, I'm writing this and I ask people who read it, the whole book, I mean the whole text, um, to pray for my mother, Monica, and my father, Patricius. Um, and I sometimes tell people, because it's true, that ever since I got to that bit when I was translating, I thought, well, that seems like a fair deal. He's given me so much joy and pleasure in my Christian life, I'll do that. So I do. Every time I say Mass, um, I remember my own parents, now gone to glory, and I remember Augustine, Monica, and Patricius. Because he asked me to, and it's not a big price to pay for a book this special. But here we have him at the beginning explaining who he thinks his audience is. And he's talking to God again, as usual. Who am I telling this, he says? Not you, God. I'm talking this story in your presence to my kind, to the whole human race, as I've translated it. Whatever tiny fraction of it happens to come, happens to come across these writings. This is Augustinian, I suspect, mocked modesty. I'm sure he struggled with his ego. It's hard to imagine him not struggling with it when he was this clever. And why is this? So that anyone who reads it may ponder the depths from which we must cry out to you. You don't cry out to God until you've hit the depths, and I can't argue with that either. Um, I've got, I think, 15 minutes left, is that right, to talk about the passages that I've left on the handout after that. Right. Um, what I want to do now is much less structured than the Whistle stop talk of um, Aristotle poetic. <coughs> Partly because um, I always come over all emotional when I start talking about Augustine's prayers because um, because I see myself in them. And I know that other people get uh, moved by him, as I do, because they see themselves in him. This is powerful stuff. This writing moves people. But I'm just going to begin with. Um, one other imitation of conversation, because this is what I spent my sabbatical last year um, looking at, just to show you he can do other kinds of conversation and to give you a sense of something that is nothing <coughs> like confessions, but is also conversational, relaxed, and in search of the truth. And that is this little passage, um, an imitation of conversation from the teacher. It's the top of page three. This is Augustine in lecturer mode. Um, I can imagine him really, well, it's obvious from reading De Magistra, it's a real conversation that he's um, writing up afterwards. And his son was obviously a bit hacked off with him at one or two points in the argument. He says, you just led me up a blind alley in order to prove something you know I don't believe, Dad. Um, and uh, I remember thinking Socrates did exactly the same thing in his dialogues when I was still reading Greek properly. Um, and it's rather charming to see him reporting that sense of frustration on the part of his teenage son. And you can see him here in the first one, B, I've, uh, sorry, section A I've given you. This is Augustine in teaching mode, and you see this a little bit in the last books of Confessions as well. This is Augustine saying, you can imagine, that, imagine I'm Augustine, you're my pupils in my school, and we've got the curtains closed to stop the hangers on in the streets from getting a free lesson, because obviously you've all paid me. Um, and he says, now, what have we got to? We've got to a conclusion and everybody will say, yes, that's, that's our conclusion. Now, let's review where we've got to. And he makes the class, you, uh, or in this case, Ardeodatus, talk back to him what he thinks that they've actually achieved, where they've got to in the argument. Um, and it's very natural. And he would have done this day in, day out as a way of earning his bread. We know he did, because he moans about how awful it was uh, and how people were catching free lessons or making a lot of noise and um, running off without pay, that kind of thing. So, a bit later on we've got um, this conversational exchange, I'm not, don't bother reading through it all now, um, it's just a, a sneak preview of what's coming out next year, I hope. Um, but you can see him again, working his way through an argument in conversation with somebody else, somebody that he loves, um, and I presume this was written up after he died, so uh, after Ardeodatus died, because he died young. 
Um, so it, it's an important conversation that they had, and he's very, very proud of the intelligence and rigour with which his son can argue. Um, he must have learned that from his father, because that was what learning was. It's a nice moment to see a little bit of Augustine in teaching mode. What about an imitation of conversation in confessions? Um, well, if you look at the second column of page three, I've put some sections here from right at the start of confessions. And I've given you the very opening passage. I've given it to you with its scripture references. There may be other scripture references there. These are the ones that I could draw out of the text. But sometimes it's difficult to isolate them just because um, Augustine's working from a, um, an old Latin version of the Bible. And so sometimes what the text that he's quoting isn't one that we recognise. I mean, for example, there were obviously um, sevenfold gifts of the Spirit in the old Latin version, but if you look at a modern text of the Bible, it looks more like eight, um, which is rather inconvenient to confirmation services, but never mind, we soldier on. Um, Augustine here um, is quoting from Psalms twice, I think, Second Corinthians and James. And to my mind, th these fragments of scripture that he's calling to mind are the voice of God talking back to him. I think this is where we hear the voice of his interlocutor. But you also see, and I've um, highlighted it in my copy, great are you, Lord, right from the beginning, magnus eis domine, eis, you are. Um, and he also talks about us, not me, us. That's not a, a plural of majesty, that means us, humankind, all of us. So in this passage, He's making it absolutely clear from the start that he's talking to God, that this is a dialogue, that this is a pure imitation of a conversation. Did this ever happen? Did this moment where he said, Magnus says Domino, did that happen? Nobody knows. It's an imitation of his talking to God. We don't know whether this is a conflation of two or five or 20 conversations with God or a prayer that he used every second Tuesday. It doesn't matter. It's a representation which is realistic rather than we can't prove that it's real. We don't know. We haven't got the, um, haven't got the evidence to make that decision. It's not reportage off the telly kind of stuff. I've put the, um, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you because everybody thinks it's so lovely and it is. It's also fairly pure Plotinus and I, I'm not sure he was very comfortable about that later on, but anyway, um, there it is for us to enjoy, whether he likes it or not. The second passage, B, it gives us the basis of the conversation, where, again, he's making it very clear with repeated references that he's talking to God and that God is answering back. Um, the thing that's most obvious to me in the passage B that I wanted you to, uh, to pick up is that Huge, this is only a fraction of them, a huge series of rhetorical questions. When I'm explaining to people how best to read confessions, there are two things I often say to them. One is, skip over the Bible passages, because you, and what I'm actually thinking, I don't explain this always, is you don't know your Bible as well as Augustine. These, these pieces of scripture may not have the same resonances for you that they had for him. If they're making it hard for you to see what Augustine's getting at, move on to other stuff. A bit like reading Dickens and filleting out all the description, you know. I know it's naughty and you shouldn't do it, but sometimes it's just necessary because it goes on and on. And the same is true with the rhetorical questions. When I send in a piece to the Church Times, if I put more than one rhetorical question, or perhaps two in a series, I get told, please rephrase. Because journalists don't like it. Because people don't like reading it. Um, and when you get this, I'm going to ask you this question, and what do you think about this, and what about that, and what about something else? How are you supposed to hold all that in your mind as a reader? What he's giving you is not um, a lot of rhetorical questions which he knows are boring because you can't answer them, you're not part of the conversation. He's showing you a, a, a sort of image through those questions of his eagerness. That's the, what I pick up. He's excited to talk to God. He, he's full of wonder and, and th the thrill of this conversation uh, with a being who is infinitely greater than he is himself, and he can't contain himself. That's what I think we're supposed to read from those rhetorical questions. There are lots of other things we can read too, obviously, but that's one. 
passage C that I put, which goes from three to four, <laughs> um, is one of the passages of confessions which I think a lot of people use and refer to because it's so powerful. Uh, because as an expression of the fundamental paradox that is God, it's hard to beat. Um, one of the things that I picked up through um, translating it, and um, I wonder if you will pick it up, if I, I'm not going to read all of it, but I'll read the first chunk and I'll read the point at which it switches. So what is my God? My God, he's talking about God in the third person here. He's not saying, what are you God? What is my God? What I want to know is God, if not the Lord. Who is Lord except the Lord? You can see what I mean about the questions, can't you? And who is God except our God? Highest, best, most powerful, most omnipotent. And it goes on and on and on. Um, and uh, that reference to Job 9, 5 is one of those examples where our modern text doesn't say that. That's why that doesn't sound familiar to you. And you go on and then suddenly it's changed. Bringing and filling and protecting, creating and nurturing and bringing to perfection, seeking even though you lack nothing. You love, but you do not burn with passion. And he switched from the third person to the first person. It's almost as if he's turned away from God for a moment to ask us, the reader, what do you think God is? What can we say about him? And then suddenly he switched back into talking to God <coughs> as if suddenly it's, it's occurred to him, gosh, I'm really glad that wasn't me, I remember to switch my arm. <laughs> he's remembered how it's God he's talking to and that's what he needs us to see. It's not, he's not in teaching mode anymore saying, what do you think about this? He's saying, God, this is what I feel about you, this is what you look like to me and we are simply observers to the conversation as if we were listening to, as you know, Melvin, Melvin Bragg on, uh, in our time on Thursday morning. We're looking in, but as spectators always do, speaking as an Arsenal fan, um, as spectators always do, we are not just watching. When we watch, we're involved. Our heart rate goes up when they come towards the goal. Our, our heart sings when Tosca sings, um, and when she's finally killed, um, what's his name? Who's the baddie? Scarpia, Baron Scarpia, that's it. You see, you see what I mean? Whenever we're observers of a conversation, we are also, in a sense, participants of it. Um, section D that I've given you, which I think is on page four, I very simply want to say one thing about that before I get onto the prayers um, quickly at the end. Um, I think this is what I would call a mimesis, an imitation of incoherence. And there are quite a few of these in Confessions where he repeats himself. He says, is there any... Is there any? Like that. And you get the same word written twice, which is vanishingly uncommon in um, normal Latin texts. And, and yet, um, he's, he's imitating, I think, normal conversation. I can't prove that, but that's what it looks like to me. There isn't a lot of ordinary Latin available um, readily uh, to most of us, but there are bits of it in people like Petronius. And when you get to read those, you get a, a glimpse of what normal Latin looked like. Um, and I think this is another one. And there he is saying, is there any mind so great or Is there anyone I want to know who? Um, and he goes on. It's a rather sad passage where he's talking about how he prayed to be delivered from being beaten at school and his parents just laughed at him. And that's, that's one good reason not to like Monica. <laughs> how could she, you know? I mean, these poor kids were being ble beaten black and blue. And she goes, oh, how hilarious. I don't think so. So there's a lot to be said for the 21st century, I think. <laughs> but I mustn't uh, ramble. We are running out of time, and I don't want to leave you without saying something about these last precious sections of, of um, text. I've given you a piece from. Uh, they're out of um, narrative order. But I wanted to give you this one from um, book 10 first, because. Rarely for Augustine, he's talking about the pleasure of loving God. I mean, it's always there in him, but as I say, the more he goes on, he seems to get gloomier and gloomier about predestination and sin and all the rest of it. And um, perhaps that's Pelagius' fault, I don't know. But, but here we have him straightforwardly talking about how he loves God and how much joy it brings him and how he wants to be with God, but like all of us, He's weighed down by the burden of habit 
He wants not to be stuck on earth, but he hasn't the strength for it, and he's pitiable. I thought that was a very um, touching glimpse of what many of us feel about our own prayer lives. Um, at least I hope so, I hope you're not alone. Um, the next one, B, is extremely precious, um, or it should be. This is the first time Augustine properly reads the Bible and properly hears the voice of God. And what does he hear for the, for the voice of God? What are the words that he hears first? I am who I am. Echia, asher echia, I think. Yes, getting a good a nod, nod from my um, former chaplain at St John's there, who's turned up to make sure I'm not ta teaching your heresy. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but there it is. What God needs to say to him is, I exist. I am. I go on going on. Um, and I shall be who I shall be. I am becoming who I am becoming. So many ways of translating it. But the truth is that God is. And when you read this, it's almost like trying to preach on bits of John's Gospel. There is absolutely nothing that I can add to that text that will make it better for you. It just is what it is, and it's perfect. And the most that I could do to express my admiration for it as a piece of spiritual writing is to translate it in a way that where the rhythm and the phrasing helped you to see what I see in it. I'm not going to read it all, but I'm going to read the second paragraph to you, because to me, that's perhaps, I don't know, there isn't even a favour, it, it is what it is, but this bit touches me. That light was not above my mind in the way that oil floats above water or sky above land. It was greater than that because it made me, and I was lesser because I was its creation. One who knows the truth knows this light, and one who knows it knows eternity too. Love knows it. And that acknowledgement leads him into what looks like an apostrophe, you know, that moment where a character on stage talks as if to themselves, but they're really talking to all of us, but actually they're talking to the unseen person too. Oh, eternal truth. And it's a wonderful piece of Latin patterning, and I've tried to get this across as well. Eternal truth, true love, beloved eternity, eternity, eternal. It, it goes on in pairs, it's sort of skipping pairs. Do you see what I'm getting at? Um, the nouns and adjectives are, are one pace out of sync. A bit like the two Ronnies doing their answer to the question before it's asked sketch or mastermind. So rather a pathetic comparison, but I hope you see what I mean. From, it says, I heard you as I'm here in one's heart, and from that moment there was no more room for doubt. What a fantastic piece of writing. And it's pretty much how I feel about God, actually, which is one reason why I like it so much. I would sooner doubt that I was alive than that truth was non-existent. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that, Augustine. I agree with you. We've got three left, and there are no surprises about um, C. Holy ecstasy. There is an enormous bibliography on this passage. And again, there is nothing that I can tell you about it uh, which will add to your enjoyment of it, except to explain what for some reason passed me by the first few times I read it, which is that he is exploring how we appreciate God through our physical senses. He has the same five that we have, sight, taste, sound, <coughs> sound uh, hearing, touch, What's the other one? Oh, no, anyway. Um, sorry? Smell. Smell, thank you. Yes, there it is. And there, there they all are. He works his way through all five. Um, he called God beauty, which is also a bit, wow, where did that come from? I hope it wasn't Plato, but, um, but anyway, there it is, out of nowhere. Um, beauty, so old and so new. Um, I showed this to a classics friend of mine um, who was formative in my own uh, interest in writing narrative, a uh, uh, classical written narrative. And he agreed with me that he'd never read anything like this. It was the first time he'd seen it, because he, he works on um, classical rather than uh, patristic texts, but he'd never read anything like this. There isn't anything like this. The closest we come is um, that I think it, it's an image, I, I ask them to print it as um, per cola et comita, just as you have it there, because, um, I think it's imitating Hebrew psalmody. I think we have got, um, it's not rhyming, it's not rhythmic, there, there's no Latin hexameter pattern or anything like that, but it is 
antiphonal, on the one hand this, on the other hand that. This being amplified by that. This being repeated in a second, second form of words by that. Um, I think it was imitation somebody. Um, and I think the same is true of the next one, which I have to say is my favourite. Not everybody else's, but it is mine. I think this is the most perfect expression of a soul in touch with God uh, that I know of, and it's from Book 12 of Confessions, and I've called it the Acme of Prayer, because as I was amused to discover after watching Roadrunner cartoons where Wiley e. Coyote always has something from the Acme something or other company. <laughs> Acme is the Greek word for perfection, uh, or the ultimate. But here it is, O oh, truth, light of my heart, do not let my darkness speak to me. Um, and again, I've done my very best with my translation to express what, not what I have factored into the Latin, but what I think is there for me to draw out. That's the translator's privilege, is to make the words speak to you as they speak to me in the Latin. Um, and, and here it is, the, the voice calling him to come home. Um, and he says in Latin, known, this is the last five lines, four or five lines, let me not be my own life, known ego vita mea sin, even as a, just a sentence that blows me away. Let, let me not be my own life. Non ego vita mea sin. I don't want to be this. Um, he says, from my own uh, self, I have lived badly. And that, that, that word from was a real struggle for me because he says, male vixi ex me. On my own part, for my own part, is really what he's saying. As far as I'm concerned, um, I've lived badly. But I wasn't going to put as far as I'm concerned because that's not good enough for this. It's not the right register. Um, and he goes on, Mors mihi fui, to myself I was death. In te, and this glorious verb, revivesco, I come to life again. It's wonderful. Um, and uh, there are really no words for describing how powerful I find that. Um, I hope I'm persuading you. We are just past five o'clock, so I'm going to come to my conclusions, which are brief and entirely predictable. Um, I don't think Augustine wrote confessions with an eye on Aristotle's poetics, and I don't think he thought to himself, right, I've written a lovely piece of poetry. All I'm doing with that um, preamble about Aristotle, rather a long preamble, um, is to make it, to use it to show how we shouldn't say, Confessions must be a biography because it's about human life. Don't make the genre out of the contents. Look at what it is and what it does, and then see uh, what you can make of that. And when, when we look at what, what Aristotle says about drama and tragedy, and poetry in general, and how poetry relates to truth, I think, yeah, I am actually justified in calling confessions poetry. I think it is. Um, having said that more generally about confessions, um, just a last word, the psychological uniqueness of a human being is a new thing to read about in a piece of Latin, that's special. The attitude to childhood at the beginning of confessions mm. is special. Um, the anatomising of an interior world is unique um, <coughs> to, or, to confessions. Um, and the putting of a human life in the context of God's creation is unique to confessions. I think the closest I can th text I can think of for these passages of prayer that I've given to you um, is the Psalms, the book of Psalms in the Hebrew Bible, uh, because sometimes the psalmist argues with God in a way that Augustine has conversation with God. It's not that close, but it's the closest I think I can think of. Um, and there's one piece I haven't put in here, which I would recommend to you if you've forgotten it, it would be good to go back and look again. And that is the double vision that he has with Monica, which redeems her in my book, where the two of them um, transcend themselves and have a vision together of the reality of God. Um, it's spiritual ecstasy, and it's not something you associate with theologians, in my experience. Not ancient ones and not modern ones either, most of the time. Um, it's quite disturbing in that respect. Um, the spiritual ecstasy is gone. Its conscience is over. You don't see it again. You just have to hope it's still there. I mean, we don't get a confessions to the return of the saint. Um, it doesn't happen. <laughs>
But all I can do, and I'm sure you feel the same about it when you turn up to this lecture, is to hope that this wonderful man of prayer still had those conversations and still had his visions and dreamed his dreams. <laughs>